republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who have died in the last week, particularly Louis F. Ross III, beloved son, father, grandfather, Marine Corps veteran, and retired Scranton firefighter. Michael J. Mosqua, devoted husband, son, father, grandfather, and brother. Esther Lombardo, loving mother of my friend and colleague Arlene, grandmother, great-grandmother and aunt. Caroline B. Hartman, beloved mother, grandmother of two of my former and exceptional students and great-grandmother. Irene Badner DeLeo, devoted mother of our friend Jack, grandmother and aunt, and their dear families and friends who suffer their loss. Also, please remember Councilman Rogan, who underwent a medical procedure today in your prayers. And also remember in your prayers, George Duffy, uh, father of former Chief Dan Duffy, who uh, recently passed away. Everyone should know him as a longtime downtown jeweler and a uh, very great guy. So please keep their family in your prayers also. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Mr. Loscombe? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A, breakdown of the eligible salaries for the liquid fuels account for the months of July, August, and September of 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, minutes of the Scranton Firemen's Pension Commission meeting held August 22, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held August 22, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, Check received from Lutherwood in the amount of $6,000, which is payment in lieu of taxes for the City of Scranton. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority's regular board meeting held June 21st, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, Minutes of the regular meeting of the members of the Scranton Housing Authority held September 10, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3G, agenda of the Scranton Redevelopment Authority's regular meeting held October 3, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Uh, just very quickly, uh, congratulations to the Steamtown Marathon Committee. Uh, another great race. Um, both the men and the women's winners were locals. Uh, Matt Byrne, um, owner of the Scranton Running Company, finished first in the men's division. And uh, Heidi Peoples um, won her third um, women's title in the marathon. Also, a uh, number of city employees were um, participants. Uh, Paul O'Hora um, had a personal best of two, somewhere around 250. Jack Davis was, I believe, uh, Fireman Jack Davis, uh, under three hours. Chief Davis was uh, a little over three hours. Uh, I'm 
know I'm going to leave people out, but uh, it was a great race, a great day. Uh, and again, congratulations. And thank you, Councilman McGough. And is there anyone else? Councilman Rogan is unable to attend tonight's meeting. However, our business administrator, Mr. Ryan McGowan, is in attendance this evening. Uh, this is particularly uh, due to the fact that Council tonight is considering emergency legislation for the passage of a commuter tax. And I will talk more about that under motions, but we thank uh, our business administrator for his participation tonight and uh, it's important to note that this measure was included in the city's recovery plan and uh, the legislation is designed to give the administration the ability to petition the court for the commuter tax. The Out of the Darkness Community Walk for Suicide Prevention will be held this Saturday, October 13th, at Courthouse Square in downtown Scranton. Registration is from 8 to 9 a.m., and the walk program begins at 9 a.m. You may also register online at outofthedarkness.org. <clears throat> Saints Peter and Paul Fall Festival and Bazaar will be conducted this Sunday, October 14th, from noon to 5 o'clock p.m. in the Church Hall, located at 1309 West Locust Street in Scranton. Delicious homemade pierogi, haluski, kielbasi, potato pancakes, clam chowder, wimpies, roast beef sandwiches, and hot dogs will be served. And takeouts are available from 11.30 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. In addition, the festival features a $1,000 raffle, specialty baskets, Portuguese delicacies, Wheel of Fortune, Try Your Luck gift certificate stand, Children's Corner, Baked Goods stand, and a warm, welcoming autumn atmosphere. Everyone is invited to this fun-filled event. And, oh, I have one more announcement that pertains to my colleague's announcement uh, regarding the Steamtown Marathon. It seems that Jeremy Evans, uh, son of uh, Mr. Wayne Evans and nephew of Mrs. Crake, came in 15th in that race. And so we heartily congratulate wow. Jeremy as well. <laughs> but they're not related to me. <laughs> and that's it. Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker tonight is Ron Elman. Council, I, I hate to go first. There, if I signed that list, it would have been like four or five spaces from the top. I still would have been first. <laughs> Brother McGough, I've, I've opposed many of your, your views and, and choices over the years, and I've never confronted you. And I respect you being elected to that seat, and, and uh, I, I know you have every right so, uh, whatsoever to your views and opinions, but I find your support of the university and its policies at this time very obscene. I, I read the article in the paper. I, I'm not trying to, this isn't a personal attack or nothing. I, I just, uh, I'm trying to be diplomatic so you don't get sore at me. <laughs> they, they just can't be allowed to go on year after year after year with this policy that is written in stone of taking over the city. 
I, I, I've talked to some, some business people and, and nobody seems to, to have faith in, in the city getting out of the dilemma. It's in the financial dilemma uh, very well, I guess. You know, the city's defenseless against them. And, and the council drawing a line in the sand a few weeks ago and taking a stand had to be done. It just, you just can't go on letting these bunch of phony nonprofits get away with murder like they have been. You know, the, last week I gave you examples. If, if you go to that nonprofit page, it's absolutely loaded with a bunch of phonies like the doctors I mentioned last week and, and restaurants. And, there's no way in the world they will fit under the non, they're not non-profits, they're businesses, they're making money. What was done about it? Probably nothing. But that's why the city doesn't have any money to fix streets and pay salaries because of all these parasites that have just eaten away the base of the city and promised to do more like Lackawanna College going to grow 40% in the medical school wanting five acres for a campus. Then, then we have Dr. Ballardi Jr. An office in the hospital, bad mouth in the city and its policies. Completely, it, it just doesn't make sense. He uses our streets, the hospitals, the libraries, just police. He probably parks his car in Nayog. If a tree branch fell on him, he'd be using our insurance but he doesn't want to pay for nothing. Nobody wants to pay for anything. They just want to use up everything we got. I, th I think if the, if the county taxes went up a third in par with us, maybe the people would just feel differently out there and see. But when we have three, over 3,000 people not paying taxes and losing their houses right here in the city. I got another empty house in my neighborhood the last few days. I got houses that are supposed to be torn down, they're not. I think I mentioned uh, a real estate man told me several months ago my house is probably worth 25,000 less than the city appraised it for at this time. And it's, when I had the fire, the, the insurance paid 108,000 to rebuild it. So it's a nice house. It's nice and modern and everything is new. It's just not, not worth nothing anymore in this city. If it was in Dunmore or somewhere, it'd probably be uh, very profitable to try to sell, but I don't want to get you mad at me, but I really feel that if you can't fight for this city and stand up like the rest of council, <coughs> you should give up your seat on that position immediately and let someone up there that wants to fight for the city and go against these nonprofits have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allman. Thank you. Bob Bolas. Good evening, Council. Bob Bolas, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Regarding uh, AC, I guess it would be the commuter tax. I think it's an absolute disgrace and a joke that this council or this administration would even consider imposing a tax such as this on people. We're where we are in this city because of the stupidity, the ignorance, and the inability of our leadership 
to manage our own assets. And now we want people from other communities to pay the price to try and bail out a city that is ran backwards rather than forward progressively. Keep in mind, this city squandered three and a half million dollars of taxpayers' monies from the golf course. To this day, we have never heard where the interest of that money went to, because nobody has a clue. Remember, the interest on that money was to be paid for parks and recreation. It was a perpetual fund that the kids sweat and the residents suffered this year with one pool. And you want people to pay the tax? You want people to bail us out? What you're doing is driving a nail in the coffin of the city of Scranton. You're driving us deeper in debt. You're not pulling us out because you don't know how to manage the assets. It's a disgrace. We should hold our heads in shame. If I were other community leaders, I would impose a tax on every city resident from the city of Scranton to go to Clark Summit, to go to the Viewmont Mall on their other end, or Dixon or Old Forge. Make it a two-way street, see how we would like it. I don't think we'd be pretty happy about it. But they manage their assets. What we're doing is just a total, total humility. Scranton is a laughing stock. Not only Scranton residents, but nationally. I've been in Florida, read about Scranton. It's a hell of a thing for us to have to do to go where we are today. If you pass this tonight, I don't care what the courts do or what your stupid little budgets we're playing around with. This is wrong. Totally, totally wrong. The university, Mr. McGough said, oh, we can't single the university out. But he made a statement that made sense last time. He said everybody has to pay. And if Mr. McGough and other people would pay attention, we have raised that issue to pass the fee collectively across everybody in the city of Scranton, the KOZs and nonprofits, and they all pay their fair share. Get creative with your thinking, your educated people. Start creating a fee that passes across everybody and can be used in the community, not just the specific clean air fee, for example, or the garbage fee that we pay. That's a taxation without representation, and it should have been abolished. Yet you could put a fee on us for the garbage when we already pay taxes for it. Because you cannot manage your assets. You're destroying us, not you or the administration. You are destroying the residents of the city of Scranton. Because we're going to suffer. People aren't going to come here. They're not going to shop, and they sure in heck don't want to put a business here. Think about it. Pay attention what the economy is and where Scranton is. Past councils and administrations have put us where we are, being ignorant, being political, and playing the good old boy club. Millions of dollars in Nayog Park, just squandering the, the residents' assets. You have so many assets in this city, and you have ignored it. I raised an issue on East Mountain for a piece of land the city owns. It's going to go to litigation because I'm going to get the answer now. And you were offered over 50000 And it is ignored by your solicitor, by your administration. You need to get forceful and straighten our own house out. Don't ask somebody else to come in as a house cleaner and try and clean up our mess. And that's the people in the surrounding area. And what you're doing, actually, you're telling the people that work at the University of Scranton. You're going to pay a commuter tax to come to Scranton and work. I said put a 1% fee on everybody, you want to put 2%. They're not going to be happy, but you're taking it out on the businesses in this city who now have to spend their time and money, forget about what it's costing the taxpayer. Take the business that has to do the police work, to do the dirty work in the city, to compute the tax and pay it. That's an additional expense and burden on their part. And then if they screw it up, you're penalizing them. If I were most of the companies in this city, I'd stop doing business here. Because this city should go bankrupt. This city needs a management. It may need a trustee. But the way you guys are running it and this administration, you're killing us. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to say that uh, I'd like to give my telephone number. It's 570-604-1212. And, you know, I'd like, I, I'd appreciate anybody who might want to call me and, and give me their opinions. Um, and really what I'm hoping is that on 5C, we need to, we need to table that or vote it down. I'm totally against a commuter tax coming to this podium for a long, very, very long time. Um, last week I did a right to know about section 312 and 313 in the Home Rule Charter. Um, I haven't received a response yet, but I don't ever remember any investigations being launched by council in all the time I've come here or any subpoenas being issued to anyone. Now, I could be wrong, and, I, and I, that's why I've done the right to know, because the city has been literally in distress since the 70s. We had a commuter tax once before. I agree with everything that Mr. Bolas just said from the podium. And, and I'm very troubled that we're going to pick on the people that are least able to defend themselves, which are the working class people, not only of this, this community, but of uh, all the other communities who come here to work. Now, I'm going to hope that the leadership and outlying communities don't try to enact a commuter tax because that's not a solution to this problem. The solution to this problem is to lobby the courts, hire a legal team, fight it out, because really, I think the city's been mismanaged, not just the golf course money. We've sold all our assets. We've had terrible leadership in this community for a long time. I mean, I can't imagine how we could have a home rule charter and how we could get where we are. Because you know, everybody blames the mayor for where we are, and I see it totally different. Because I see it as council having the obligation to do oversight and conduct investigations to the city's affairs. And I just haven't ever seen it happen. And I agree with what Mr. Bolas also said about Nayog Park. Only, only the one thing he did miss is that the children were paying to swim there. Really, to be honest with you, the residents of this city get nothing for their tax money. Nothing. I mean, you know, somebody came up here and gave a figure that there were 25,000 homes in the city and allegedly people paid $500 or less. So if you compute that or uh, calculate it, that's about $12.5 million. So how can we be spending all this money? Council should have did something long ago. I mean, take a calculator and multiply 500 by 25,000 and see what number you come up with. But yet we're millions and millions, 122 million in debt there, allegedly somewhere near 100 million to the pension fund. And my other question is, where was the PEL if they were the supposed to oversee all this? So really what we have is a total breakdown in government across the very broad spectrum. And the last person they're worried about evidently is the working poor because Scranton's had a real wage problem for over for decades, going all the way back to the Scranton plan, which is long before my time. And what I'm saying to this council is it's time to just table this, okay? And it's time to table a lot of things. I think the council made a very serious error because they introduced a second recovery plan. I think it was dated the 23rd or 24th of August and never held a special meeting on it. And they determined that they were going to go with which plan? I don't know, the first recovery plan or the second one? Because really all that matters here, as far as this government's concerned, is you want money. The city can't manage itself. And all you want is everybody who can't defend themselves, property owners, wage earners, to just give you all of their money so that more can be squandered. And the state's just going to stand there and watch and do nothing because they sent the PEL here. I don't know what their plan was for the PEL because it hasn't worked. And I haven't seen any. I saw Mayor Connor's administration sanctioned when they did the American Anglian deal. But to be honest with you, this is a sham because you're just beating up the poor, helpless, defenseless people 
the wage earners, and it's been going on in this community for generations. And the people sit at home, and like I said before, you can elect all the spaghetti dinner politicians you want, but what we really need are leaders. And we lack leaders across the whole spectrum of politics in this country because too many people think only Democrats and only Republicans have answers and they have control over the political machine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Doug Miller? Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening. I'd like to begin with uh, going back to a few comments I made last week uh, regarding the university and the nonprofit uh, discussion we've been having. Uh, you know, after I had gotten done speaking, uh, later on in motions, uh, Mr. McGough uh, addressed a few of the, uh, the questions I had regarding the university. And, you know, with all due respect, I'd just like to respond to the question I had was, you know, what has the university done for the city of Scranton uh, for decades? And, you know, Mr. McGough went on to talk about the Mulberry Street Corridor and the project they've done over there uh, recently and how going back 20, 25 years ago, uh, it was a blighted area. There were many issues over there, some problems. Uh, it was a haven for drug dealers and a lot of other chaos. And today, as we travel up there, we see new sidewalks, street lighting, uh, paving, uh, and other, a whole uh, wide variety of other things. But I think where we sort of uh, mislead people is, in, we, we mislead people into believing that this was done to better the hill section where this was done to benefit the university and their students. And I think that's where there's a misconception, is that we believe the university is making investments to better us, when quite frankly, that's not the case. They're doing this to better themselves. And I think we, we need to uh, clarify that with the public because I don't feel it's fair to um, mislead them into believing that this is going on because they're trying to help us out. Um, you know, we see how they have no problem spending millions of dollars on purchasing properties throughout the city, $2 million for the Adlin building. Um, and Jerry Zabowski, I believe his name is, the vice president of the university, was even quoted in the paper as saying that at this point in time, they simply do not know what they're doing with that building. And this seems to be the case with a lot of the buildings they purchase in the community. They never have plans for them. But they have no problem spending millions and millions on buying them and taking them off the tax rolls. It's also my understanding, and I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe uh, they purchased the Farley's building, and yet they don't know what they're doing with that building as well, another property that will be taken off the tax rolls. And yet, they can't give the city more than 175000 a year. And it just truly, truly, truly upsets me, knowing they have no problem spending millions on buildings that they have no, they have no idea what they're doing with, yet they can't contribute uh, to a city that's financially uh, in disarray. And that's all I have to say on them. We know where I stand on them. I'm totally disgusted with it. But I know we have a council committed to going after them and holding them accountable. They will pay their fair share. And we're going to continue to vigorously pursue all avenues to make sure they do, because we have four individuals that are committed to doing so. Uh, on to the commuter tax. Obviously, that's the issue tonight, 5C on the agenda. Uh, we're dealing with legislation that's been drafted to pretty much just take this to the next step, which is asking the Lackawanna County Court uh, for approval of this tax. And for months and months, we've had a lot of criticism from people at the podium, the media, and from those outside of the city who have had objections to the commuter tax, raising issues that they don't, fair, they don't find it fair to penalize others outside of the city for our financial problems. And I think everybody knows at this point in time my stance on it, and I, I will repeat it once again. I disagree. I look at it from a different standpoint. I don't believe we are penalizing anyone outside of the city and making them suffer the consequences. There's no secret. We know the situation we're in. And it's the result of decades of fiscal mismanagement by the administration, the Doherty administration. Past rubber stamp councils who blindly rubber stamp legislation allowed the borrowing and spending to go out of control. And we wonder why we're in the situation we're in today. And you know, for weeks I've listened to people come up here and criticize this council as if they've had something to do with our financial problems. And they're totally misinformed. If we take the blinders off, and if we paid attention, we would clearly see that in the last two and a half years, this council has taken drastic measures
to reduce the burden on the taxpayers of this city. While we want to come up here and we want to whine and cry about a commuter tax and increases in taxes, why don't we take a trip back to 2010? I know for some people they may want to forget about that, but I don't. I can recall a council majority coming in and drafting a 2010 budget that cut the property taxes for the residents of this city by 10% or nearly 11 percent, I believe it was 10.55, and Mr. Joyce, I'm sure you would uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, nearly 11 percent tax reduction for the residents of this city. And yet we never hear anything about that. We never hear about council taking steps to help businesses by cutting the business privilege tax. And yet we want to come up here and we want to point the finger at a council majority that's done everything in their power to reduce the burden. I don't forget it. As a matter of fact, I'll continue to remind people of that. It feels like there's less uproar. There was less uproar back in 2007 when our property taxes were raised 26 percent by Mr. McGough and his fellow rubber stampers. Seems we want to forget about that. You know, I think it's absolutely ludicrous to criticize council, whether it's the media or people at this podium or those outside of the city who notoriously like to tell us how they feel we should run our city. Throughout the whole process, I never heard an alternative. You're against the commuter tax. You're against this revenue enhancement. You're against that revenue enhancement. But did you ever take the time to do the homework and come up with a plan yourself? I understand we're not elected officials. And that's what I'm constantly faced with is that, that statement. We're not elected officials. I understand that. But at the same time, when you're critical and you're against something, you come up with a plan yourself. We didn't have that. So in the future, if we're going to come forward and we're going to be against the commuter tax or anything else, come forward with a plan yourself. What do you suggest we do? If we don't implement the commuter tax, that's $12 million in revenue we lose out on over three years. Where do you suggest we come up with $12 million? We have financial obligations. Unfortunately, the administration has caused us to be in this situation. <coughs> so I'm asking tonight, without a commuter tax, where do you come up with the $12 million? And I'd like somebody to come forward and tell me how you plan on doing thank that. Thank you, Mr. And Miller. Thank you. And to the council, keep doing what you're doing. Stay the course. And don't thank be sidetracked by the criticism. Thank you. Is thank there you. anyone else who cares to address council? Good evening, Council. Uh, Maurice Schumacher, Good city evening. resident, taxpayer. Um, I'd like to pick up a little bit from where I left off last week. Mr. Joyce, you said you would find out about the new parking when the new parking meter evaluation was to begin, and when is that? And yes. how long will it last? Um, Mr. McGowan, you could correct me if I'm wrong. IPS was the um, bidder chosen, correct? So it's going to be this winter? Are we looking at this winter? And how long, how, what's the duration? 60 days. Thank you. Okay. And then I asked last week to how close we are to the, um, uh, our ceiling under the Unit Debt Act. You know, it's really tragic that here we are uh, in October, and I believe I read in the paper this week uh, that. We're not going to have an audit until the end of November. I mean, how can we calculate what our our borrowing base is, or what our how much debt we have without the audit? So, what what did you find out about how close we are, in, in, including the the borrowing for this year? I'm still looking into that. Okay, I did some calculations. I came on the on the city alone to uh, within ten. We're in ten within ten million dollars. So I could be wrong, but if I had the tools to work with uh, that we should have had months ago, I would have it. But uh, I just think I don't know. I just don't know if if we're at the point where. We should go bankrupt now or bankrupt later. Uh, we just, if something falls out, I don't know where we stand. But um, I guess we'll wait and see. And um, just a, a general question. 
Uh, now that the process of converting from a 2A to a Class 3 municipality has been underway for several months, is someone able to report on when this process should be completed? I don't have any information for you. Okay. Uh, have you received the status of all of the loans made uh, th uh, through OECD that Not was requested yet. last year? Okay. Now, here's one that, that disturbs me, so I'll, I'll just read this. This is from September 6th. Uh, Mrs. Evans, you said, again, with my colleague's agreement, I would like a letter sent to Ms. Abley requesting responses, unanswered questions contained in our August 28th letter. When was the last payment made on that loan? We're talking about the 408 Cedar Avenue property. What was the balance on the loan prior to the sale of the property? And who would be legally responsible for payment in full? Include an additional question, please, Mrs. Craig. Will OECD take legal action to recover the remaining balance on that loan? Uh, it's my understanding uh, maybe only $20,000 roughly was paid on that what I believe was a quarter million. Do you have the, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Abel is usually pretty prompt. Do you have that, the letter she in response? She did respond, but she, and I don't have it with me this evening. I can report on it next week for you or actually show you the letter. But all of the questions were not answered. Uh, I believe that she indicated the property was sold during, uh, uh, was it the county? Yeah, it was a sheriff sale. Yes and that uh, the amount of money the, c the city realized from that sale, I believe, was $8,000. But as you indicated, I wanted to know who remains responsible for that loan. Well, yeah. we're well. calling it a loan. I believe she was calling it a grant. Well, and the that It was grant money, but we loaned it. Yes, and I agree with you. So. I still had several questions, and we sent those along, I believe, and uh, I haven't gone through my mail this evening, but prior to that, I didn't receive a second response to those additional questions. Okay, maybe you could send out another, because I think that's, that's important, as are the other loans that may be yes. delinquent or, um, or late payers. I know things are bad, but... Um, and then, uh, of course, again, it's no uh, no surprise. I have been saying we do not, we shouldn't be trying to balance our our budget with 5C. It's it is taxation without representation. I think it's immoral, and I I just would encourage you to not. To not pass this, and uh, and especially as an emergency. I mean, this we've known this was coming since the um, since the the revised recovery plan was was passed, and that was this was part of it. So I don't know how we can consider this an emergency tonight um, when you have one one. I think people have a right to know how their uh, council people that they voted for. Uh, would vote on this, and Mr. Rogan's missing tonight, and I think he should uh, he should have at least two readings, if not three, to allow people to respond. And then I have an, one other question, which is on going back to the uh, I guess it was three weeks ago on the 20th of September when uh, when the solicitor uh, expounded on. This, what the city of Scranton and the Scranton redevelopment did in adopting the university plan and admitting that there were stately homes that were in that area and it was adopted as a blighted area even though there were, um, there were, I'll, I'll follow and finish with this, but even though there were decent homes that were still paying taxes in that area, uh, now, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hughes has also said he, he wants to go after all the variances, but I remember back, well, I think it was right after this council was elected, uh, 
Mrs. Evans, you and, and Mr. Hughes negotiated something with the University of Scranton, and I don't remember precisely. It was having to do with those dorms, though, uh, that increased the the payment in lieu of taxes from, I believe, 110 to 175 for the university. Why didn't the council act at that time if council had the authority to to turn down that variance? Why why wasn't the variance turned for those dormitories challenged back then? Because those are really the only only major buildings they have that are used for the university. If I could, I want to go home and watch the debate, but I'll be very blunt and quick. Yeah. Council had nothing to do with the variance. There's an appeal period that council did not go to that hearing, so that it did not have any standing to challenge the variance. The variance was already granted by the zoning board. Council has no control over that. The zoning board is an independent agency. Council has no control over that. However, what I stated, and it's been so misinterpreted, I mean, I, I just love people from out of the area and out of the state, experts commenting on what I said when they never even knew what I said. What I said is that council should oppose every use variance, not every variance. We want to yeah. see every variance that's coming through, but the opposition should be to a use variance, so you can't put a seven-story dormitory in an R2 zone where the limit of any building is only 40 feet. And yet that dormitory never should have been built on the northerly side of Mulberry Street. It was a use variance. That use is not permitted. Use variances are an extreme exception under zoning law. But council, in, in second order we get, or third order, I'm sorry, we get all these red including the agenda of of what the the board is going to to do, and I don't understand. And why I said at this time, now what we'll do is there's a use variance. When we get everything, I'll go in and oppose a use variance. It shouldn't be granted. Any use variance to any nonprofit, no matter who it is, should be denied. They should not be allowed to expand where the use is not permitted in that zone. The University of Scranton has outgrown its zone. Understand. And now to go on the northerly side of Mulberry Street to even put a parking lot in. That's not permitted in an R2 zone. The city should oppose it okay. until the University of Scranton comes in and says, we should be the champion to go out for the city and to get all the nonprofits to contribute $2 million. They should be the one that should be here spearheading the whole deal. They're the biggest one. They have a quarter of a billion dollar budget. They have a bigger budget than the city, the county, and the school district combined, and probably multiplied by one and a half. Okay. One, one last question, because the, the Commonwealth Medical College, do they have a, an, uh, an institutional footprint, too? I don't know. I think that they would be... But they're also expanding, so... I think we, sh we should find that out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there Thank anyone you. else? Yeah. Hi, Chris. Yeah, welcome back, buddy. Chrissy. I missed you all week. That they they, would, they would have had the bell on the west side if oh, you yeah. put it up they that just, night. They, they just played for that night, Frank. They just blew the game. Hey, they blew hey. it. They're two yeah. tough teams, buddy. Oh, thanks, Chrissy. Well, I tell you, got two games left, guys. Jack, that's it. Three games left, boys. Remember one thing: we win it all this year. Yes, is going to win all the way this year, I think. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you, Chrissy. Is there anyone else? <coughs> Ms. Five Craig? Eight. Motions. <coughs> Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions? Um, I will wait until the um, legislation to comment on those. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have any comments or motions? Uh, I just have a couple briefly, and I will comment on the legislation when it comes up to that. But um, first of all, uh, 
I understand that the uh, person that was responsible for the arson fire in West Side was convicted today. And um, I would like to send uh, my heartfelt thank you, and I know it's from every citizen in the Scranton, to our police and firefighters who responded to that horrific scene that evening um, that resulted in the death of two young children. Um, the hard work that the police and firefighters did not only at the scene, uh, what they had to remember from what they've seen there, the representation at court to rehash the whole scenario, but their uh, continuing investigations. And, and arson fires is really one of the hardest to prosecute. So, you know, all the diligent hard work on behalf of the, the uh, prosecutors, the firefighters, and the police that were involved in this, um, I think all citizens deserve to give them a, a thank you for the resultant sentence. Also, I have uh, a letter from the Kaiser Valley Community Center, or Kaiser Valley Citizens Association, I'm sorry. And it's addressed to me, Councilman Jack Lascombe. Dear Councilman Lascombe and City Council members, my name is Bill McDonald of West Granton, and I write to you as Vice President of the Kaiser Valley Citizens Association. The Kaiser Valley Citizens Association has recently become aware of the documented fact that the only West Scranton firehouse on Luzerne Street has been closed during the past three months of July, August, and September, an alarming 82% of the time, or 77 out of 92 days. Our organization has been aware of the station closings as we individually drive by since the neighbor next door to the station notifies passerby with a large sign on their fence. We had no idea of the magnitude of closings until we inquired. We invite you and the public to a West Granton Fire Safety Meeting on Wednesday, October 17th at the Kaiser Valley Community Center at 7 p.m. to discuss this very important concern. We will invite Fire Chief Davis and Mayor Doherty to address this situation and answer citizens' questions. As a neighborhood association, we do not want to wait until something bad happens before we address this situation. Sincerely, Bill McDonald, Vice President, Kaiser Valley Citizens Association. So I know there's been a lot of, you know, people in the west side questioning the closing and the amount of closings and stuff like that, just as happened up in the East Mountain. Um, and this station on Luzerne Street covers quite a wide area from the Taylor Line all the way up to Newton Ransom, uh, up the old Sanitarium Way. There's a lot of areas on that West Mountain where there are no hydrants. There is no uh, water for protection. So it, it does, you know, I, I think uh, we've been very fortunate citywide uh, that we haven't had a major disaster. And Everyone knows how I've been preaching about this for quite some time now. I think uh, part of the major problem was the turn back of over three and a half million dollars for the SAFER grant, which would have kept these stations open. I don't know if there's a lack of communication at the top or what the problem was, but uh, it was a very, very bad decision that can place a lot of, that has placed a lot of lives at risk. Fortunately, it hasn't come to that yet, but unfortunately, it may. And then it's too late. And now the people in Kaiser Valley are coming together. They're coming together on w next Wednesday at 7 p.m. and they're inviting anyone from the West Side area to attend this meeting, voice their concerns, and to, uh, they said they're inviting Fire Chief Davis and Mayor Doherty, and I will be there as Chairman of the Public Safety Committee on this board uh, to represent us, and anyone else's is also welcome to come. But this is a serious issue. And, and it, 
it's tough. I and mean, we're getting into the winter heating season now, which is even worse. The holiday season, people start turning their furnaces on and stuff. And, and again, as I stated before, with the closure of these stations, people in other sections of town who currently have their, their uh, truck in the station might feel comforted. However, probably 80% of the time now, more so than before, their company is responding to another part of town. So the jeopardy is throughout the whole city. It's a sad state of affairs, but the money was in place to open all these stations and it was given back. Just like we could have had more police officers on the street with COMD funding and somebody missed the ball there, we would have had 15 for, for the price of two. Now we're paying for six to have six. It doesn't make sense. Who's going to be at fault when something happens? Who's going to get the blame? Where's all the yelling going to come from? And to make matters even worse, I think everyone knows here, if you have a home and you leave it empty for a period of time, it starts to deteriorate. Well, we could only imagine with the amount of time these fire stations have been closed, the de deterioration that has been taking effect in these buildings. I actually went through the three stations on the west side today, and I have to tell you, I'm appalled. Because of the amount of times they're closed, when a home is occupied, the way it's set up, the firefighters that, are, that, are, that man that station 24 hours a day, seven days a week, maintain that house. They do all the house cleaning, they buy their own supplies, they keep everything up to date. It, it, it's, it's their own house. They're a tenant in a city property, basically. What the city has done now has thrown that tenant out for three, four weeks at a time. Do you know what happens when your house is closed up for three, four weeks at a time? Not only the deterioration from the elements, the invasion of rodents. You would not believe what I happen to see in each of these stations. Right now, they are unfit for humanity. They should be condemned. I've seen the city condemn homes that were in better shape than, than what these fire stations are right now. The men aren't there to maintain them. They're the city's property. The city has not maintained them. Not only are they having problems with rats and mice, I mean, uh, they moved the, the, the crew from Engine 9, which was actually Engine 8's crew because they've been, they've been keeping Engine 9 stationed with one company and closing the one up on Market Street, closing the one on Luzerne Street, keeping engine, moving Engine 8 to Engine 9 station on Main Avenue, centrally located on the west side. Well, I believe it was yesterday's shift, one of the firefighters happened to be sitting on the chair, and he had a guest crawl all over him, right out of the chair. Then they happened to see a rat, and they found more and more. They went over to Engine 7. I've got photos, folks. You would not believe it. So the answer today was to send the crew from Engine 9 up to Engine 8, work out of Engine 8. So right now, the whole west side is covered from Market Street. So if you live down near the Taylor border, you're praying for who gets there first, Engine 2 from south side or Engine 8 from Market Street. The ironic thing is, when they went to open Engine 8 station, they found a couple dead rodents. It's a problem. Um, you know, they could say it's the budget, they could say whatever. But I don't think anyone should have to stay in a property that's unfit for habitation like that. And I don't believe it is the responsibility of those police or, or firefighters, actually, who operate on those stations because they're out of there. To come back one day and find five weeks worth of mess 
It appears that the buildings themselves have been left go structurally, maintenance-wise, as far as I could remember. There's leaks in the ceilings. I mean, you know what happens there. Look, what's, they're closing schools because of that. The mold developing. I don't know what the answer is. I think we should have a very fast meeting with the administration, get an inspection agency in there, and get a professional cleaning agency in these buildings and get them fit to let our men return and work out of them. And if they're going to keep them closed, they have to have somebody maintain these buildings. But I happen to see a lot of structural deficiencies, which I did take pictures, so I think an engineer has to look at these buildings too. Engine 9 is settling quite a bit. And uh, not only the, the mouse and rat problem, but I think there's a lot of structural problems over there. Um, definitely, you know, we're fighting budgetary battles every day. But these are firehouses to, to protect the firefighters, to protect you, and the equipment. And we have doors that the springs are broken. I believe it's rescue, where there's one spring and it's ready to go. The other one's gone. Now what's going to happen? Right now they could probably fix that for $200. What's going to happen by letting it go when that door comes down on that $500,000 rescue truck? Or comes down on one of the men working there. The problem is, we could resolve these problems for dollars and they're letting them go to where they become costly. I don't know what the answer is, but I think we should have some kind of an emergency meeting. I'll discuss it with my colleagues later, uh, with the administration, uh, with the firefighters, and, and do whatever we can to get these uh, buildings up to shape so they could occupy them when they have to, to protect the residents they serve. Not only that, there's several pieces of equipment that are still down that need repairs. We have to address that, as well as a number of police vehicles. We're letting our public safety f departments and fleets by the wayside. It's been a history for the last 10, 12 years. I don't know what it is. There hasn't been anything in the budget for increases up until the Supreme Court ruling for police and fire budgets, for payments. And it appears there hasn't been a penny in the budgets to repair any of the structures. I'm even talking cosmetic repairs. For the most part, on the interiors, the firefighters have historically taken care of the buildings themselves. Painted them, did repairs, stuff like that. But they cannot touch the exteriors. They cannot do the structural stuff, and, uh, and they cannot maintain these buildings when they're gone from there for long periods of time. I just wanted to let everybody know the state of what's going on here. And again, you know, the administration could turn around and say, well, we don't have money because of the Supreme Court ruling. We don't have money because of the, the budget cuts. And, and, and again, the Supreme Court ruling was ruled by a majority of Supreme Court justices who obviously felt that the city had acted in bad faith for over 10 years when all they were requesting, the police and firefighters, was a minimum cost of living increase. And I guess the uh, Supreme Court was so exasperated with what they witnessed through the proceedings that that's when they slapped the $34 million award on the city. And for the administration to turn around and blame the police and firefighters for those costs, police and firefighters know where the, where the costs came from. The inactivity of the city to fairly negotiate all this time. They let it go to the Supreme Court. And in spite of all of that, the police and firefighters sat down and negotiated with us, with the administration, and reduced that award by over $15 million. And I think that's applaudable. Many people say, oh, they shouldn't have taken anything. But, you know, 
10 years without a basic cost of living increase and now to live in the conditions and work in the conditions they are, OSHA would have those buildings condemned. But I don't know how our license and inspection department right now can leave those buildings open in the condition they're in when I've seen them condemn properties in this city for much, much less. I think it's a sin, it's a shame, and we definitely have to sit down immediately and resolve this issue. Because it's a safety issue for the public, they're being protected on that side, and for the gentlemen and ladies that work in these departments. And I guess that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Yes, I do. As one knows, on tonight's agenda, there's legislation for a commuter tax, a non-resident earned income tax. In the recovery plan that was drafted by the administration and Scranton City Council, the commuter tax is an integral part of the plan's implementation. In 2013, according to, the, according to Pell, the Pennsylvania Economy League, the commuter tax is expected to generate $2.5 million in revenue for the city of Scranton. In the following years of 2014 and 2015, the commuter tax is expected to generate $4 million in revenue for the city of Scranton. In order for the city of Scranton to implement this tax, it is required that the city of Scranton gains court approval every year that the tax is implemented. Scranton City Council has been advised by the administration that it is important this legislation is passed quickly since budget season is fast approaching and the administration needs to get a court date since the increase in the tax will need court approval before implementation. In order for the city to implement the tax before January of 2013, this legislation needs to be passed now. It was anticipated that the legislation would go through three readings. However, it has taken the law department time to draft the appropriate legislation. The commuter tax is an important part of the recovery plan. Without it, we would need to fill a $2.5 million hole for next year, which would likely come in the form of a tax increase. Secondly tonight, Scranton City Council has received correspondence from tax collector Bill Courtright regarding the Scranton Single Tax Office collections and distributions for the period ending on September 30th, 2012. First, in regard to the real estate tax collection, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $11,852,412.28 in current real estate taxes. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $10,965,343.96. God bless you. With this in mind, there has been an overall increase in real estate tax collections of, of approximately $887,068.32 thus far. This is an increase in collections of approximately 8.1% from the same period last year. Secondly, in regard to delinquent real estate tax collections for the same period last year, so far the tax office has collected, or for this, or, uh, for this period this year, the tax office has collected $476,031.45. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $550,938.74. With this in mind, there's been an overall decrease in delinquent real estate tax collections of $74,907.29 thus far. This is a decrease in collections of approximately 13.6% from the same period last year. Third, in regard to the local services tax, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $1,143,385.82. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $1,376,145.74. With this in mind, there's been an overall decrease in the local service tax collection of $232,759.92 thus far. 
This is a decrease in collections of approximately 16.9% from the same period last year. Fourth, in regard to the business privilege and mercantile taxes, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $1,746,933.69. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $1,497,417. With this in mind, there's been an overall increase of $249,516,000 dollars and 69 cents in business privilege and mercantile tax collections. This is an increase in collections of approximately 16.7 percent from the same period last year. Also to report, the Scranton Single Tax Office has collected six million one hundred thirty four thousand seven hundred seventy one dollars and seven and 71 cents this year in earned income taxes. As far as offering a comparison to the amount of taxes collected last year, it would not be comparing apples to apples or oranges to oranges since Berkheimer took over the collection of 2012 earned income taxes. The $6,134,771.71 collected by the single tax office this year is primarily fourth quarter earned income tax receipts from 2011 that were paid this year. Overall, the Scranton single tax office in regard to the real estate tax, delinquent real estate tax from 2011, the local service tax, the business privilege and mercantile tax, and the business privilege and mercantile tax, the Scranton Single Tax Office has collected a total of $15,218,763.24. In the same period for these taxes last year, the Scranton Single Tax Office has collected, had collected $14,389,845.44 for these taxes. This is an approximate increase in overall tax collections of 5.8% from the same period last year for the tax office. <clears throat> Third, Northeast Revenue has submitted two reports to Scranton City Council regarding delinquent tax collections for the, periods, for the period ending on 9-30-2012. As one may or may not know, Northeast Revenue collects and distributes Real, delinquent real estate tax collections for the city of Scranton with the exception of 2011 real estate, uh, delinquent real estate tax collections which of course are collected by the single tax office. Also, as one may or may not know, the revenue collected by Northeast Revenue is not all distributed to the city of Scranton. Northeast Revenue distributes all delinquent tax collections for the years 2004, 5, and 6 directly to Penn Star Bank. This is due to the Scranton Redevelopment Authority's default on a loan taken out previously to cover the advanced sale of delinquent taxes, which must be paid back. For the years of 2004, 5, and 6, for the period ending on 9-30-2012, Northeast Revenue collected and distributed $13,977.52 to Penn Star Bank. This includes $2,829.97 in delinquent taxes from 2004, $42,13.25 in delinquent taxes from 2005, and 57.0432 in delinquent taxes from 2006. For all other years, with the exception of 2011, for the period ending on 9-30-2012, Northeast Revenue collected and distributed $79,619.23 to the city of Scranton. The majority of these tax collections came from the years 2010, 2007, and 1998. As one may or may not know, with the scope of work currently going on in the business administrator's office regarding unfunded borrowing and other pressing matters, the administration has been behind on audit issues. Scranton City Council has received an update from Rossi and Rossi regarding the audit status at the present time. A summary of the content of Rossi and Rossi's letter is as follows. In Rossi and Rossi's January 20, or, um, 26th letter, 
the original letter that they sent. Rossi and Rossi stated that in order to issue the uh, December 31st, 2011 audited financial statements by May 31st of 2012, the outline of the 2011 audit timetable contained in the letter had to be adhered to. Because Rossi and Rossi had not received the information on a timely basis, the completion of the audited financial statements has been delayed. Rossi and Rossi further provided a list of open items required to be completed that have not yet been completed as of October 3rd, 2012. As of March 31st, 2012, the following were to be completed that are still not yet completed. Finalized fixed asset schedules and entries necessary to record activity for GASP 34 conversion, including infrastructure reporting, actuarial calculation of GASP 45 post-employment benefits. In addition to the aforementioned, there were memos from Rossi and Rossi that were still open as per the date of their letter to the city. The memos that were open as of the date of the letter were as follows. The April 25th memo on special cities fund demolition. The April 25th memo on special cities fund fire loss security account. The April 25th memo on special cities fund inactive accounts. In the letter, Rossi and Rossi asked our business administrator, Ryan McGowan, to provide to provide expected completion dates for the open items because Rossi and Rossi needs to coordinate requests for attorney letter, letters responses near the issuance of the audit report. After receipt of the open items and audit testing is completed, Rossi and Rossi will issue a completed financial, or completed financial statements and present a draft of the full financial statements for the city to review and complete the management discussion and analysis section of the audit report. The financial statements, according to Rossi and Rossi, cannot be issued until they've received attorneys' responses to audit request letters. The required city's management discussion analysis of the financial statement in the city's, or the city's representation letter and an exit conference is held. With this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please follow up with Ryan McGowan and ask him for a timeline of when the open items can be expected to be completed, and that's all. Thank you. Good evening. Included on tonight's agenda are two loans from the Scranton Office of Economic and Community Development to city businesses. Both loans are in the amount of $150,000 and provide a term of 15 years as well as a 2.5% interest rate. The recipients of the loans are Freckles and Frills, a daycare facility in South Scranton, and 520 Madison Avenue Associates, LLC, a bed and breakfast in East Scranton. The latter project was denied a loan in April 2012 by City Council due to delinquent taxes owed on the property, which were later paid. It is to Council's credit that it discovered tax delinquencies and declined approval of OECD loans or state grants to Mulberry Lofts and 520 Madison Avenue Associates until taxes owed to the City, School District, and County were paid in full. Since OECD submitted legislation to City Council for loans to individuals or groups that were tax delinquent in 2011 and 2012, City Council requests proof of paid taxes for all proposed OECD loans. Therefore, Mrs. Craig, please send a letter to Ms. Abley requesting that a copy of paid receipts for taxes is attached to legislation that is submitted to Scranton City Council by the Office of Economic and Community Development for any and all loans and grants provided and or facilitated by the Scranton OECD. Also included in Council's agenda this evening is the return to the table in seventh order of the clerical union contract. The legislation was previously tabled because City Council and the union were involved in litigation. Fortunately, the litigation has been dropped and council is now able to take its final vote. Additionally, the mayor sent emergency legislation to city council regarding the increase in earned income tax for non-residents who work in Scranton. 
it is necessary to move the legislation by emergency in order that the city would receive a court date in 2012. Further, the commuter tax is contained in the city's revised recovery plan, which was previously approved in August 2012. This legislation allows for the administration to petition the court for permission to enact the tax in 2013. Uh, I just want to add to that, the city anticipates a commuter tax lasting no longer than a three-year period, and was said earlier, each year the city must uh, petition the court once again for the continuation of the commuter tax. Next, throughout the week, Council Solicitor Hughes and I continued to discuss the status of local nonprofits. And at this time, I call upon Attorney Hughes for his comments and advice. I think it was two Saturdays ago, I went up to the Naples Center University of Scranton. I went to Chick-fil-A. It was quarter to three in the afternoon. Um, the area in there was jammed with people. I had to wait in line to buy a Chick-fil-A, uh, and both to get the Chick-fil-A and also to pay for it. Um, I looked around. As I said, it was about quarter to three in the afternoon. There were a substantial number of uh, students and other people there. Um, there, I went into the bookstore. Actually, my wife and I did, and she purchased something in there as a baby gift with the University of Scranton logo on it. And after that, we've done some investigation. We have determined that the Chick-fil-A is operated by a franchisee. I would believe the same is so for the operation of the Quiznos, um, the Starbucks, the other area there where they sell pizza. I didn't see a franchise on that. Um, I've done further investigation and it is, I've been informed that the bookstore is not owned by the University of Scranton. That is leased out, it's a leased operation. Based on my experience, I would, it would be my educated opinion or guess I was going to say that there is probably a base lease rent plus a percentage override to the University of Scranton uh, for these leased operations. There is also a small mini mart there. Uh, I say a mini mart, you know, an area where, like a convenience store, uh, to sell sodas and, you know, other items. I do not know if that's a leased operation, but. I think one thing that should be done is that all of these operators of all of these stores, if they are leased operations, if they are franchisees, and they lease the space from the University of Scranton, they should be paying mercantile taxes to the city of Scranton. Um, I think that the single tax office, I think a letter it would be in, in place in order um, to have Mrs. Craig write to the single tax office to determine if any of these businesses, and they are businesses, uh, in the Naples Center are paying, are filing their tax returns to the city, if they're paying the required taxes. And I also think that they should look at it and get a copy of the leases to see exactly what their leases say. I would be extremely naive to think that these spaces are being leased for a small consideration. Um, there aren't too many restaurants in downtown Scranton on a Saturday afternoon at 2.30 or 3 o'clock that are jammed with people, uh, tables full and people buying, you know, Quiznos, uh, buying hoagies, uh, you know, chicken sandwiches, pizza. Um, I think this is a big money-making operation. I think it should be looked into by the single tax office. Uh, maybe they have been paying their uh, 
you know, their, their business taxes, but at least we'd find out. And if they're not, uh, I think the single tax office should go up there, take a look at every one of those businesses, and if they haven't been paying their taxes, make sure they pay the taxes, and they should probably also get a copy of the lease to see exactly if there's a percentage override on their gross sales to the University of Scranton. Thank you, Solicitor Hughes. And yes. In, in, just to answer part of that, in, in the economic impact that the University of Scranton sent to us, it did indicate that Aramark, which is the cafeteria, mm -hmm. and Follow, which is the bookstore, pay local services tax and local tax. I don't know. It, it doesn't include any of the other franchise um, situations. Thank you. And uh, I would state that Aramark is not the franchisee for the Chick-fil-A. I'm not, I'm no, not saying that. that yes, but, yeah. Yeah. But I think it should be looked into and see what it is. Uh, and certainly, if that's being run on a lease basis, that section should not be exempt from real estate taxes. Any nonprofit that has, even the Scranton Parking Authority, even though the Scranton Parking Authority is exempt from real estate taxes, the areas that they have leased out for commercial operations are taxable. Mm -hmm. And they pay real estate tax on that. Now, it's a pass-through tax because it's assessed by the assessor's office and to the Scranton Parking Authority in accordance with their leases, they then pass that through to the tenant to pay their pro rata share of the real estate taxes. If it applies to the if it applies to the Scranton Parking Authority, the same should apply to the University of Scranton on the first floor of the Naples Center. That should be taxed. And you know, in fact, I think the Scranton Parking Authority has a, a better exemption than with the University of Scranton. That's my opinion. I think that it should be looked into, and certainly if there if there's businesses operating up there that are independent businesses under lease agreements, they should be paying their taxes to the city. They certainly put enough of businesses out of business up there, yes. small restaurants and everything else that no longer exist, um, that they, they should be taxed. And I think that the area that the county should look into um, taxing the, the, you know, the first floor of, the, of that center for real estate tax purposes. Uh, Mrs. Craig, on behalf of Scranton City Council, uh, if you would draft that letter, please, to the single tax office, and I ask that you would speak with Solicitor Hughes. I know that you were out of the room temporarily uh, when he was discussing this matter, so that we can be certain to include uh, all of the points made by our solicitor. Thank you. Uh, finally, Mrs. Craig, please provide council members uh, at your earliest convenience with copies of the city's noise ordinance. Because of the number of citizens' complaints we've received concerning boom cars, we should review the ordinance to be certain it addresses the nightly disturbance, and if so, then we can forward it to the police department for enforcement. If it is not uh, if the language uh, doesn't specifically address this problem, then I think council should look toward uh, amending it. Also, I'll forward citizens' requests submitted by email to our office for notification to the appropriate department heads. And that's it. 5B. Amending file of council number 46, 2012, an ordinance entitled Amending file of council number 33, 2012, entitled Establishing a no parking zone in the 900 block of North Washington Avenue, State Route 3023, on the westernmost side of said street, pursuant to the highway occupancy permit application of the Commonwealth Medical College from State Route 3023, segment 90, offset 1,000, to State Route 3023, segment 90, offset 1219, for a distance of 219 feet, 
to correct the incorrectly identified segment numbers of State Route 3023 to correct the incorrectly identified offset numbers for the no parking zone. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C, amending file of council number 11, 1976, entitled an ordinance as amended, enacting imposing a tax for general revenue purposes in the amount of 2% on earned income and net profits on persons, individuals, associations and businesses who are residents of the City of Scranton or non-residents of the City of Scranton for work done, services performed or business conducted within the City of Scranton requiring the filing of returns by taxpayers subject to the tax requiring employers to collect the tax at source providing for the administration, collection and enforcement of the said tax and imposing penalties for the violations by imposing the wage tax at two and four tenths percent on earned income for the year 2013 for residents and authorizing the city solicitor to petition the court of common pleas of Lackawanna County to increase the non-resident earned income tax from one percent to two percent emergency certificate attached at this time I'll entertain a motion that item 5c be introduced into its proper committee so moved second on the question all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5D, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials for the city of Scranton to enter into a loan agreement and make a loan from the Community Development Block Grant Program, project number 150.35 in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to 520 Madison Avenue Associates, LLC, to assist an eligible project. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5D be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5E, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials for the city of Scranton to enter into a loan agreement and make a loan from the Community Development Block Grant Loan Program Project number 150.34 in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to Freckles and Frills Incorporated to assist an eligible project. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5E be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yeah, I'd just like to brief comment. Um, where Freckles and Frills is moving to is the former St. John's Parish Center. Um, they purchased it. Yeah, I believe in 2010. Um, so what, what they're doing is that they are taking a piece of property that was off the tax rolls. They have done amazing renovations to it and um, are placing it back on the tax rolls. As, and uh, it, it, it's really a, a remarkable um, job that they've done with that parish center to turn it into uh, a very functional um, child care center. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. <clears throat> I make a motion to suspend the rules to move item 5C to 6th and 7th order to be considered for final passage based on the attached emergency certificate. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. At this time, would anyone like to address council on the emergency legislation? I'll just reiterate what I said before. I don't think this is an emergency at all. The uh, 
the recovery plan was passed well many weeks ago and uh, this is known that it had to be here we've done it before a decade ago or almost two decades ago and this should have been on the agenda before and it should have had three orders I'm really disappointed that this council has probably set a record for uh, ramming uh, ordinances through uh, with three readings in one night and it's very disappointing thank you thank, thank you, you. Good evening again, Doug Miller. Um, just to basically reiterate what I said earlier, um, this is a uh, piece of legislation that we've had ample time to discuss. And you know, I definitely take issue with the comment that you know this council has a reputation of ramming ordinances. Uh, when in fact, a recovery plan that we've been discussing for months now, um, we've all had the time to come forward and raise any objections we've had to the commuter tax or any other uh, part of the recovery plan. Um, we need the revenue, as I stated. We face challenges financially, and we're coming up with all kinds of alternatives to alleviate the burden. And as we were made aware tonight, we remove, a we remove the commuter tax. Council's faced with the difficult decision of having to raise taxes on property owners, something we do not want to see happen. So I commend you for the actions you've taken, and continue to stay the course and stand up for the taxpayers. You've been unfairly criticized, and I take offense to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the comment I have here tonight is that, in my opinion, I find the recovery plan to basically be bluntly, possibly illegal because um, council pushed a, re a revised recovery plan forward without a hearing. And there's two different dates for these recovery plans. And the other thing is, we had a commuter tax once before. It didn't do anything for us. And like I said previously, we're just exploiting people who can't defend themselves here. And we're fleecing people for a government which doesn't know how to control its spending and doesn't know how to live by the Home Rule Charter. And I just find it amazing that we're going to ram this through council in three readings in one day. Because for a council that talked about transparency and caring about the, the city and the residents, I find that to be not true. It's easy to tax people out of their homes. This city, people are wondering what the answer was. The answer was bankruptcy. The answer was tough. It was to ask the court to intervene and allow the city to reorganize and try to take some of the uh, burden off the taxpayers. And, um, you know, all this other stuff is just ridiculous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'll just briefly comment that uh, in addition to what I stated under motions, uh, I do agree that the legislation should have been presented two, three, possibly more weeks ago. However, it was in uh, the process of being developed for that time period, and it was reviewed and tweaked by several entities, one of which is the Department of Community and Economic Development. So it was not possible to have it on the agenda until this evening. And, uh, of course, as we all know from the uh, arrangements made for the unfunded debt borrowing, it is very difficult to get a court date in the Lackawanna County court system within the time period that's prescribed for the uh, revised recovery plan. Should we fail to move tonight and allow it to go through that is the legislation, it's traditional readings, then we are risking uh, failure to obtain a court date in 2012 and moving this issue into 2013. And finally, I do say that um, I take umbrage with the uh, comments made against this council and ramming legislation through. I think if one looked at the percentage of the emergency legislation that's been passed uh, since 2010 versus what is passed according to uh, the traditional three readings, uh, you would see a very, very minute percentage. But more importantly, the city has been in a state of emergency, and we are all well aware of that. We're also aware 
of the repercussions of not addressing those emergencies and the severe repercussions of bankruptcy. And so whenever council has entertained emergency legislation, it is legislation that was sent to us by the administration and the reasons to pass it rapidly were sound and urgent. And if we want to meet the crises that we're in, these steps are necessary. Mrs. Craig? Sixth order, 6A, formerly 5C, reading by title, file of council number 62, 2012, in ordinance, amending file of the council number 11, 1976, entitled, in ordinance as amended, enacting imposing a tax for general revenue purposes in the amount of 2% on earned income and net profits on persons, individuals, associations, and businesses who are residents of the city of Scranton or non-residents of the city of Scranton for work done, services performed, or business conducted within the city of Scranton, requiring the filing of returns by taxpayers subject to the tax, requiring employers to collect the tax at source, providing for the administration, collection, and enforcement of the said tax, and imposing penalties for the violations. By imposing the wage tax at 2 and 4 tenths percent on earned income for the year 2013 for residents, and authorizing the city solicitor to petition the Court of Common Pleas of Lackawanna County to increase the non-resident earned income tax from 1% to 2%, emergency certificate attached. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question? Yes, I, I'll comment at this point in time. Um, many of the things that were included in the recovery plan, including this, the commuter tax, were, were things that I don't think any members of council particularly wanted. Uh, they were things that were forced upon us in order to meet the needs of providing services in this city. And services not only for residents of the city of Scranton, but also services for the people who do business in the city of Scranton. Those people who come into the city, work in the city, shop in the city, eat in the city, they are all benefiting from the services that we provide. Um, fire, police, all infrastructure. And while it's, again, while it's not something that was particularly wanted, I believe it's something that's needed. And I think it's something that we need to do at this time in order to take care of the services that this city provides. And I will, I support this as I support the other parts of the recovery plan. And the last thing that I want to say is that this isn't final, even though we vote on it tonight. Well, two things I'll say. We have known that this is, was going to be before us from the time that the recovery plan was adopted. So th there was ample opportunity to discuss and to, to deal with the ramifications of this um, legislation. And I don't think it's something, yes, we're voting on it in, in one night. Um, but I, I think that we have had ample opportunity to, to look at it. And um, again, I'm supportive of it. And hopefully, um, when it goes to court, that the, the judge or judges see that it is an emergency, that it is something that needs to be done in order to rectify the problems, the financial problems that the city of Scranton is having. Um, just because we vote on it tonight, it, it does not finalize mm -hmm. the, the issue. 
uh, we still need to go before the court and have them approve this legislation. So it's far from done. And, um, but tonight, I, I do approve of what we're doing with this tonight. Thank, Thank you. And just to repeat what I said earlier, uh, basically the legislation enables the administration to petition the, the court of Lackawanna County for a date for a hearing during which the administration will present its need for the commuter tax. So as Mr. McGough said, this certainly isn't a new issue and uh, council is doing what it can to help the city survive, to help the taxpayers of Scranton, and to abide by the timeline sent, uh, set by the Pennsylvania Economy League and the State Department of Community and Economic Development for the implementation of provisions of the revised recovery plan. If I could just add quickly, I agree with my colleagues on their comments and their statements here. I don't think uh, it's something that, that uh, we all feel palatable including, but it was part of the package, the package to, to save our city that we were elected to save. Um, it was part of the recovery plan, and it has to be brought to court every year for the next three years. And um, I believe all of us have friends and relatives that live out of the area that will be affected by this. Uh, we all have uh, fellow colleagues, elected officials and friends in many of the townships and boroughs surrounding Scranton that will be affected by this. Um, I understand some of their concerns and uh, you know they have the right to raise the issues and the concerns for their constituents but we were elected here to represent the city of Scranton and you know you hear comments you read in the paper no one has been watching where the money has been going for years and years and that's where I think we're different we are watching we've only had a little over two years at the helm but I think you're starting to see the positive impact of someone actually watching and looking at every detail it hurts when you hear comments that you know it's just going into the black hole and that I think we've passed a number of, of bits of legislation that ensure us the ability to make sure that these monies are going to where they should be going and not disappearing as has been done in the past. I know my colleagues will be as diligent in watching this and, and having this recovery plan succeed because we're all part of it. You know, we own it. We voted for it. I do ask our neighbors surrounding Scranton to bear with us. Um, a stronger Scranton will be a whole stronger area. And uh, again, it isn't in our favor to do this, but it's all part of the package to bring us back on sound footing. And uh, I believe that uh, we will be approving this this evening. Thank you. And if I could just add, I'd like to echo uh, some of Mr. McGough's comments. As an elected official, you're sitting up here and you're faced with many tough decisions, such as raising taxes, commuter taxes. Um, we have the real estate transfer tax and the recovery plan as well. And I don't think anyone wants to raise taxes on someone or impose a commuter tax however the city is in such dire financial conditions right now that these things are necessary to avoid bankruptcy and if bankruptcy happens the tax increases will be astronomical if a receiver is appointed to just take over the operation of the city of Scranton and I don't want to see that happen. So as Mr. McGough said, I do support this and I will be voting yes for this tonight. Um, just quickly and lastly, I'll add 
to piggyback a little bit on, on what you said, Mr. McGough, not only do we provide the services, but our city hosts the county seat. Uh, if you want to get married, you're coming into Scranton for a marriage license because we also uh, include the register of wills, the uh, recorder of deeds, the social security office, the federal courthouse building, the major hospitals, the major colleges and universities, the social service agencies. And so uh, from the time, you know, that you're born right through your, your demise, you're coming into Scranton for its services. And the truth of the matter is that those buildings are tax-exempt properties. So over 30% of our property is non-taxable. And I think when everyone is using the services of this city, whether it be the roads, uh, enjoying, you know, being able to get into the hospital because the roads have been plowed, uh, enjoying fire and police protection while you're within our city limits. That is certainly, um, an, you know, these are important services. And they're services that aren't offered by many of the areas outside the city of Scranton. They don't have paid police and fire departments. And as a result, they're ill-equipped to take those types of entities that I described within their boundaries because they cannot provide adequate protection for them and service to them. And so it's important, I think, that uh, everyone consider these factors and uh, to remember as well that it's but one of many new revenue generators. This one, however, is the one that has a time limit attached to it. And it's not a tax that is imposed endlessly. And hopefully, if the city is able to get back on its feet more quickly than anyone anticipates, there won't be a need for three years of a commuter tax. And that's it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. <clears throat> I make a motion to take file of council number 4, 2012 from the table and place it into seventh order for final consideration. We have a motion. Second. Second. Thank you. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I make a motion to amend item 7A as per the following. Excuse and the me. amendment is Excuse a letter of agreement. I think I have to read it first, Councilman Joyce. Oh, very well. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, Resolution Number 4, 2012, previously tabled, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate officials of the City of Scranton to execute and enter into a collective bargaining agreement with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 2462, Clerical Union. I make a motion to amend item 7A as per the following. And this is a letter of agreement dated October 1st of 2012. <clears throat> this letter will serve as an agreement between the union, Local Lodge 2462, District 1, IAM, and AW, and the City Council of the City of Scranton of the following. A, 
In order to resolve the current appeal of, this, of City Council of the decision of the arbitrator on the IAM and AW's grievance regarding the positions of Executive Assistant and Confidential Secretary in the Office of, of City Council of the City of Scranton working in the Office of City Council of the City of Scranton are positions included in the collective or in the CBA. The IAM and AW City Council and the City of Scranton agree as follows. Effective January 1st, 2013, these two positions are permanent positions within the bargaining unit covered by the CBA and will be considered a separate classification within the CBA. These positions will fall under the jurisdiction of City Council and City Clerk as defined in the Administrative Code, Article 2, Section 6-4C, Appointments and Removal of Employees. City Council and the City Clerk will be responsible for the appointments and removal of employees under the jurisdiction of the Office of City Council City Clerk. B, the positions of Executive Assistant and Confidential Secretary in the Office of City Council of the City of Scranton will be subject to all provisions of the CBA, including the just cause provision and the grievance and arbitration provision between the two parties with the exception of Article 25, Seniority. <clears throat> it is further understood that whenever management rights is referred to in the CBA with reference to the separate classification in parentheses, Executive Assistant and Confidential Secretary in the Office of City Council or the Office of Council of the City of Scranton, it will revert to the jurisdiction of City Council and City Clerk. C. The people who currently hold these positions will carry their seniority for the purposes of vacation, sick, personal, and retirement benefit with that position. D. The pay scale of these positions in the Office of City Council of the City of Scranton will be defined as Executive Assistant at 1642 per hour and Confidential Secretary at 1517 per hour. E. Both parties agree that either party deems it necessary to discuss and define the duties of these positions in detail. The other will do so in a reasonable amount of time after such request is made by either party. F. The provision of this agreement will commence January 1st, 2013. This agreement between all identified parties is contingent upon the newly created two clerical union positions as identified as rental registration assistant slash housing inspector and financial analyst Department of Business Administration being added to the 2013 City of Scranton budget as adopted by the Mayor and City Council. G. City Council agrees that it will withdraw its appeal to the Commonwealth Court, case number 1118 CD 2012, in writing to that court by October 12th, 2012. H. This agreement will be enforceable through the grievance and arbitration provisions of the CBA. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to amend. Do we have a second? Second. On the question? Uh, just uh, one clarification. If one of these positions should be vacated, will, would it be filled from within the union or can it be filled by a person from outside of the union? I wasn't sure how that read. Well, the, you know, according to the Home Rule Charter, the hiring still lies in the hands of City Council and the City Clerk, and I believe the letter of agreement is stating that as well. But those positions must be union positions, but they now have a separate classification. Right. So, I, I, that so part I understood. I just didn't know when it would be replaced if somebody left it. Would it have to be someone who was already in the union to take that position? The answer is no. Okay. It could Possibly be. So. This 
specifically recognizes that the council has the right to fire, fire, discipline the employees with their office. And once they, were, once they were appointed, then they would become members of the union? Correct. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else? All those in favor of the motion to amend item 7A, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. As chairperson for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7A as amended. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I hereby declare item 7A as amended, legally and lawfully adopted. 7B, formerly 6A, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council 62, 2012, amending file of council number 11, 1976, entitled an ordinance as amended, enacting imposing a tax for general revenue purposes in the amount of 2% on earned income and net profits on persons, individuals, associations, and businesses who are residents of the city of Scranton or non-residents of the city of Scranton for work done, services performed, or business conducted within the city of Scranton, requiring the filing of returns by taxpayers subject to the tax, requiring employers to collect the tax at source, providing for the administration, collection, and enforcement of the said tax, and imposing penalties for the violations by imposing the wage tax at two and four tenths percent on earned income for the year 2013 for residents and authorizing the city solicitor to petition the Court of Common Pleas of Lackawanna County to increase the non-resident earned income tax from 1% to 2%. Emergency certificate attached. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further... We, uh, before we adjourn, uh, wish uh, our colleague well um, and hope that he recovers quickly. Thank you, Mr. Yes, McGough. Yes, I second that. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.